Touched on. Uh, Lucy was a free thinker, uh, a socialist to start with, a uh, syndicalist, and an anarchist. She was a crusader for freedom, uh, freedom, equality, uh, solidarity. You know, she. I love Lucy, as as Rogers pointed out. Like, uh, she was born in Waco in Texas in 1953, and it's hard to find. It's hard to find facts about Lucy's early life because. She was, uh, whenever being interviewed, she'd say, uh, and asked about her life, she'd say, oh, well, it's not about me, it's about the cause. Which is like, it's a great thing to say, but from a historical point of view, it's a fucking nightmare, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Lucy was um, uh, of mixed heritage. So she's uh, African, half African-American, half native Mexican Indian. Like. Um, and she lived. She lived in Waco. I, I, from my view, I, I think she was probably a slave. Probably because it's you know it's Texas. It's before the Civil War, uh, and she's mixed race. You know. So I. But there's no evidence for that. That's just a guess from her. And she also she lived with uh, Oliver Gatherings, and he was a slave. So. I don't know. I would guess that that would probably be the case. Um, da, da, da. Lucy. Also, the other nightmare thing about Lucy uh, historically is that she she uses lots of names, like uh, lots of surnames: Carter, Gonzalez, Hull. So it's very hard to trace a lot of her history. Um, but we'll get on to her and Albert. Uh, they met in Waco, and as Roger said, uh, he was a scout in the Confederate Army. Uh, he became radicalised um, and got involved in radical republicanism and black suffrage. I mean, he was actually, him and his brother were in the Confederate Army. There was actually a, was a cav there was a cavalry brigade named the Parsons Cavalry, which his brother was an officer in, like, um, his old brother. Uh, but when he left the Confederate Army, he left with a mule um, and came back to Waco and sold the mule, swapped it for land, a small amount of land, uh, and got uh, ex-slaves to work the land with him, uh, which all his old friends, he didn't really like that, uh, all the Confederate. Um, it was... Uh, so, oh, so him and Lucy got married in 71, 72 in Austin. Uh, it's not clear how official the marriage was. Uh, and then living in Texas today at the time, you had uh, a lot of influence from the Ku Klux Klan, um, which, you know, a mixed, a mixed race couple with someone who had left the Confederate Army was now working with ex-slaves. They, they, they got quite a lot of abuse as you would. And so they, they left and moved to Chicago uh, where they got involved in uh, the Working Men's Party, uh, the Labour Movement and the Socialistic Labour Party, not the American Socialist Party, as we've said earlier. Um, and as Roger was talking about the 77 rail strike, again, I, I can only reiterate, it's, it's very important in, in American history. Um, and had a massive impact on Lucy and Albert, um, who, 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 who were, you know, involved in, in, in socialist ideas before, and and thought, you know, Lucy, Lucy stated that that um, looking back, reflecting, she wrote an uh, she wrote an article called The Principles of Anarchism, where she reflects back on the '77 real strike. She she says that um, at the time she thought that. The power and and the party can be used to uh, uh, used in a good way for the oppressor. Uh, I'm going to skip it because I'm getting a bit. That's all right. I'm new to this sort of thing, you see. Um, so back to the railroad strike. It was really it had a big impact on Lucy and Albert. Albert because he was working on the print at the time and he was working in a lot of different papers. And by being involved in it, the paper he was working for. Uh, then blacklisted him with all other papers within Chicago 
then said he's, you know, a commie and this sort of thing. Uh, he then <coughs> left and started writing for a lot of the radical papers within Chicago. Um, da -da -da -da. So while in Chicago, uh, Lucy was working as a seamstress uh, and got involved in, I uh, was one of the main organizers in uh, the Working Women's Union where she unionized other seamstresses. Is that a word, seamstresses? Yeah. Uh, she, I, I, you know, the same as any other trade, I would imagine that they were making these beautiful dresses that they'd never be able to afford. Um, and this is so they they were easy to radicalise. Like she was involved uh, in the eighties. She was involved with the Knights of Labour. Um, who Roger touched on earlier. I would equate them to someone like the Respect Party nowadays, because they sort of groom these, in my eyes, extremists like Catholics. Um, and even though they're a trade union, they have some very Odd views, like like the Respect Party, you know, they groom these extremists uh, and talk about a lot of things that sound positive. But then a lot of members of that party have some very odd views, like you know. Um, but yeah, that's that's the night of Labour, anyway. Um, Demolished them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was around it was around 1880 that Lucy and Albert started uh, considering themselves anarchists uh, 1883 uh, and they got involved in uh, the International Working People's Association uh, which uh, they, there was a paper then called Alarm which was produced by the International Working People's Association which Albert uh, edited and Lucy wrote for uh, this is where Lucy wrote her famous article to the tramps the unemployed uh, the disinherited and the miserable where she urged uh, poor and unemployed people to learn how to use explosives. Uh, I'll, I'll read you some of it. Uh, let every dirty, lousy tramp arm himself with a revolver or a knife and st uh, on, the, on the steps of the palace. Oh. Let every dirty, lousy tramp arm himself with a revolver on the steps of the palaces of the rich and stab them or shoot the owners as they come out. Let them kill them without mercy and let it be a war of extermination without pity. Which is quite a harsh, you know, it's quite, <laughs> you know, uh, you know. She was a mod track. Yeah. <laughs> was a mess with that. So after, after writing this, she was branded as a bit of a troublemaker, you know. <laughs> <Well> yeah. <laughs> so, you know um, yeah, I mean, this dish brought a lot of attention to, to the paper and the group. Uh, and, uh, you know, like Roger says with the trial, I and mean, this is before all Haymarket and all of that, I, I don't know why they didn't go after Lucy, because for me, the stuff Lucy was writing was, was the most militant, you know, and. She, to me, like a lot of anarchists don't really know a lot about Lucy. She's, she's the most important, in my eyes, of all the anarchist writers. It's not like someone like Emma Goldman. <laughs> uh, to me, Emma Goldman, you know, she, what, what Emma Goldman was doing at the time was, was having these meetings with middle-class people about women's sexuality and being sexually free and all of this sort of thing, you know. Whereas Lucy was talking about the root of all the problems, which is class struggle. And that's the issue for me and for Lucy and for all of us, you know, all that other stuff is irrelevant, all your single issues and all that bollocks, you know, until we get control over our lives, every aspect of it, all of that's just a fucking, this reformist bollocks, like. Um, anyway. <laughs> I love Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm only touching on Lucy because um, Roger messaged me though. This is why I'm a bit nervous and I haven't actually got a vast amount of information, but I will be doing another talk, another day about Lucy because um, she's amazing. She, she was one of the founding members of the IWW. Um, 
which is lovely. Me, <laughs> 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 but, you know, one of the, the other things about Lucy is that she died in 1942, which is like, that's not long. That's like tangible. It's like, it's not, I know, you know, you've got grandparents who, who were alive then and, and it's... it's she probably would have kept going. She died in a fire, didn't she? She did die in a, yeah, she, 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 she died in a house fire um, and her bloke, well, it was a lover, uh, George uh, Marshall, went in to go and save her, um, but couldn't, and died the next day of injuries and stuff. But right? um, well, there's loads more to her, and loads more. I'm not doing her justice with all of this. Like, um, but if you're interested, there's a book called Speeches, Articles and Essays by Lucy Parsons, which is amazing. Um, anyone who considers themselves an anarchist should read The Principles of Anarchism by Lucy Parsons. It is the best thing ever written on anarchism, even today. I, I read it recently on holiday, and it's the sort of thing you can show your friends who think this is all nonsense, like, you know, it's written in an amazing way. Yeah. That's great. There Thanks. we go. That's a sweet name. That's a sweetener for the forthcoming talk. <laughs> Mount Lucy. Um, right, the second part is I'm just going to. This is a bit more of a, a bit of a curveball. This one, but it's um, it's really looking at. I call it a tale of three monuments, but um, it's really to look at how the Haymarket's been remembered in Chicago. Right, the centre point. You know, you think. So we're, we're talking about memorials, monuments, and commemorations here. Um, this photo here, which you'll recognise, Samuel, is. Um, the current, I'll show you in a minute what the actual, this is the current Haymarket Memorial at the site of the, well, near the site of the bombing, which was put up in 2004. And um, a comrade asked us to lay a red rose there when we went out there, so that's what we did. If you want to click the next one. Oh, oh, oh that was backwards, I think. Oh, that thing. No, there you go, next one. Right, can't see this very well. I might be able to pull the blinds down even. You see all right, can you? Yeah, I can't yeah. tell from it. Well, this is this is the hate. I'm going to show you three three monuments now, which are all about contesting the history of, of the Haymarket event. Uh, so this monument was put up in 1987, so it was a year afterwards, and well, it must have been after, just after the ex uh, they were these guys were executed. The, 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 the um, spies, what was it? Spies, uh, Parsons, Ling, or killed himself, Fisher. Um, an angle, and it's part. Of, it, now it's not actually at the site. The monument. Uh, you weren't basically allowed to put a monument up at the site of where the Haymarket incident occurred. So this is part. Of, I think it's Forest Hill Cemetery, which some was visited last year, and um, you know, kind of. It's got a fairly dramatic monument. It's got names on. It's got Spies's quote. You know, we will. You know, you try and strangle us now, but we're going to be bigger than you historically as a result. So that's the first monument. So bear that in mind. So that's about. I don't know. It's about five miles away from the actual sea, it's in West Chicago. Amazing um, graveyard, I'll come on to why in a minute, but anyway, that's the central monument. That is like, kind <coughs> of, I could I suppose you could argue our monument to it. And that's, that's where it was, so not at the site. The next one, this is the police monument, <coughs> right? Which was put up in 1896. Um, I think that's the, when it's been finished. So this is a monument to the guy, it was Deng, I think his name was Matthew Deng, who was the cop who got the bit of shrapnel on his leg and then bled to death. So that was put at the site in the Haymarket, or close to the site in the Haymarket. And, um, and the third one is this one, which was put up in 2004, at, again, actually close to the actual site of the Haymarket. And this, was, this memorial was meant to kind of balance the history a little bit, that's the plan, right? So the money's put into this by the state and it's built <coughs> and um, that's the you know, that's where we lay the flowers and stuff like that. So they're the three monuments. So you've got the one that was put there originally in 1897, the police one 1896, 1887, 1896, and then this one very recently. Now I found it amazing to, that, that, that for really, I was thinking how come it took to 2004 to put up a monument to this event, which is now worldwide known, you know, it's worldwide major historic event, you know, create 
this leads to May Day and all the other stuff. We haven't talked about all that process, but it becomes this very, very important history, event in Labour history. So that coming took until 2004 for this monument to arrive. And I'll kind of explain why, because it's a bit of a check in history. Um, you take the next one, I can't remember what's next. Oh, if you go back then. Right, I'm just going to read you a little bit of history now of what, of what happens with these, these three oh. monuments. So you leave, leave, if, you, yeah, if you go back to that one, that'll do. We're going to be talking about the police one quite a lot. Hello. The one before the police. That's the other way. Oh. That one. Oh! <laughs> you go back with this. Oh, that'll do. That'll do. <laughs> Come on. Just, can you, if you can find the copper monument, that'd be good. Which is a. Oh. Let's go another way. Uh, okay, wrong way? Yep. Yeah. 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 Right, right, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> bear in mind these three monuments. Go. One, one in the cemetery miles away, one at the yeah. spot. Yeah. The police one, and then one that's brought up in 2004. Right, when they're building this statue, the state, and private um, donators, imagine the bosses probably put a fair bit of money into it. When they were building this, um, there's a whole series of incidents that occur. First of all, 1888, they're building this monument. They um, found an unexploded bomb in the building site. Okay, so that's a bit odd. Somebody apparently tried to blow it up and failed. In 80, the year after, they this... Got date wrong, but anyway, I think that's probably got the date wrong now, it's 1889. But anyway, they put the, they put the, um, the monument up the year after. Um, in 1890, they found unmistakable traces of an attempt to blow the statue up. So that's twice they've had a go at it now, within a couple of years of the event. Um, in 1893, the, other, the monument in the cemetery appears, you know, and eventually is completed. Um, and in 1903, this, this monument is continually vandalised, but the main thing is these crests, state crests and stuff, were stolen off the monument several times, but notably in 1903, where they, all the crests were stolen off it and they never recovered. Every time they put the crest back on, they got nicked or vandalised. Uh, 1927, on May the 4th. Now, when I heard about this story, right, I just saw the date 1927, right? And the story is, on, in 1927, this monument is, um, is knocked completely over by a, by a tram, right? <laughs> Who, now you think, somebody said, Kieran said to me last night, you can't run a monument over the tram because they go on rails, right? Yeah. But what, what happened was, is the guy went really, really fast and took it off the rails, right? And <laughs> threw the statue, right? Knocked it over. But I just thought I'd check the date out of when that happened. And funnily enough, it was May the 4th. Right? <laughs> which is the anniversary, right? 1927, May the 4th. And then I found out what the driver said afterwards, which he said he was sick of seeing that policeman with his arm raised. <laughs> so he decided to take it out. I mean, you know, no disrespect to the anarchists with their bombs and everything, but that is quality. That is quality. <laughs> <laughs> take it, I mean, they you know, blow it up a bit, you know, a bit take a tram through it, and that's what the geezer did. Right? So he basically had enough of it. And, you know, I don't believe that it was just a coincidence it was made of four. Like, you know, I obviously wasn't going to say that, was he? Oh, yeah. He, but he said, I got sick of it and I, cr I took it down. So he, you know, cheers. To find out, I don't know the guy's name. We've got to find the bloke's name because, he, you know, he needs to be remembered, don't he? He put a tram through the police monument. Um, the police monument was then repaired and it was moved for a long time away from that site. It was moved into a park. Um, and in 1956, they decided to move it back, and they put it on a new pedestal right near the bombs, where the bomb went off in the Haymarket in Des Plaines. Um, so it gets back, it's 1950s now, they've got it back into the location they want it after the accident with the tram. Um, in 1965, on May the 5th, so it's tomorrow, 1965, Mayor Day unveiled a plaque um, bearing, he unveiled a plaque, um, it was declared this monument, historic landmark, this monument, and they, and they have a plaque with the name of all the police officers that were killed uh, in the Haymarket incident. Obviously, perhaps not remembering that seven of them were killed by the police themselves, but anyway, they put the name of the eight coppers who died and up on this thing. It was you know, kind of attempts by the authorities, Mayor Daly and all that, to try and you know, popularise the police and you know, bring this back onto the agenda as a terrible attack on the police. Um, three years later, on May the 4th again, <laughs> the monument was, was badly damaged um, during a Vietnam War protest when people threw black paint all over it. So um, the vandalisation is starting again. Um, 
Now, 1969, the Illinois Labour History Society, right, start lobbying the city, saying, look, we want a proper memorial. It's kind of in reaction to this, you know, the mayor's event. You know, we want, actually want our memorial on the site, not just this copper. So they start this campaign to try and get a permanent, permanent monument from the other perspective on the, on the site. Uh, in 1969, October 1969, this, this um, statue is blown up by the Weather Underground. I won't go on about the Weather Underground too much. If you know anything about it, they come out of the Students of Democratic Society, decide to declare war on the state, um, mainly due to the Vietnam War, but they become anti-capitalists and, and revolutionaries in the commas. Um, so they, they blow it up. And I mean, I looked at where the Weather Underground were up to this stage. That was literally two days before the Days of Rage anybody knows anything about the days of rage. It's basically where the Weather Underground and members of the SDS decide to take the war in Vietnam onto the streets of the US. And what they meant by that was mobbing up and smashing the hell out of not only the police, but also all the, industri uh, all the financial districts. And in Chicago that happens. And fair play to them, they had a pop. You know, it was brave. And so the, the idea was to take militant, violent action onto the streets of, of the US in reaction to the uh, US involvement in the Vietnam War. So bring the war home was the slogan. So just before those events, the Days of Rage, they blow up the, the police statue. Um, so a year later, right, um, the monument is reinstalled, they repair it, they redo the statue, and thanks to private donations and funding from the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and other unions, the police get their statue back. Repaired, yeah. The International Brotherhood of Teamsters and other unions put money in to helping restore the police statue, which is the only monument at the bomb site. You know what happened. Um, that's so. That's over the next months following the Weather Underground bombing in 1970. One day before the anniversary of the Weather Underground bombing um, in October, the Weather Underground blew it up again. <laughs> so they've just got it all back. Got this all out of the ceremony. Gotcha. And this time they do a proper job, they blow it to fucking pieces, basically. Um, so there's consternation at this point, because the statue's been blown up twice in a year, that um, this is going to carry on. So they decide, the city leaders decide to protect, they have ideas about how to protect the beleaguered statue, right? The first one was to install it inside a plastic dome. <laughs> so they would have put a huge plastic dome over it. Which is a bit weird, because you think, well, you probably wouldn't be allowed in, would you? I mean, you'd have to sort of stand outside and look at the moment. That was one idea. The other idea, which I think is really kind of interesting, because it kind of connects with sort of mass production, post-war <coughs> mass production, they decided to make a large number of fiberglass replicas, mass produce them. <laughs> <laughs> so they'd stick one up, you know, smash it up, and <laughs> bang them up, like, you know. Anyway, they're not those two ideas on the head, it's been um, you know, impractical, so, but they did decide, Mayor Daly, to order a 24 hour, 365 days a year police guard on the statue, which cost at that stage $67,000, which I guess is for several hundred thousand dollars now, to protect this statue. So the coppers standing there all the whole time protecting it. Um, that went on for some time, until 1972, when the police decided they probably couldn't afford it by that stage because of the oil crisis beginning. Away. So they decided to move the statue into the central, in front of the central police headquarters. But it still wasn't safe. So in 1970, uh, 1976, they moved it into the Chicago Police Training Academy, inside, in, inside the fences and everything. Uh, meanwhile, the Illinois Labour History Society have got, you know, get ownership of the Haymarket Monument, the one that's in, um, in the cemetery, so they're kind of looking after that now. So this is progressing this campaign to get something. Um, in 1985, um, various committees, Haymarket committees and the Illinois Labour History Society asked to get a park at the site. You know, they're fighting all the time to get something. Um, and finally, in 1992, the site of the Haymarket bombing was declared a historic landmark by the city of Chicago. So not based around this statue as being a historic landmark, but just the location. <coughs> now, where this statue used to be, when it was moved, blown up and all that, there was a kind of, they left this bit, this sort of stuff. Plinth here was left in place. Um, so there were various actions against the remainder of where the police statue had been, including in 1996, um, they were doing some sidewalk renovation at the site, close to the statue and an artist got in there and managed to fool the um, people who were working there to installing a small hand cut mosaic dedicated to the anarchist martyrs. So I obviously had a letter from the council and suit on and said, you know, I'm going to put this down, it's got going there. They stuck it in, it was there for five weeks before the council realised. <laughs> so um, this is 1996. Uh, 1997, um, 
Sorry, <coughs> 2000, eventually, after all this campaign, the state of Illinois contributed $300,000 towards a memorial at the bottom site. Okay. In 2001, during, this isn't to our time now, is it? Or your time. 2001, during a May Day celebration, um, a performance artist known as René Areco, he's he went to the site where this statue was and repeatedly jumped on the and jumped on the plinth and stomped for several hours on it. And this is where the plinth monument is. And I it became known as the Areco Stomp, a new dance, and um, it became fairly famous in Chicago. It made a lot of press, and you know, so people went there and did the Areco Stomp on it. Two years later, um, a large number of flash mobs sort of turned up with another artist and did the did eight hours of stomping or something, which I think. Guess something to do with the eight hour thing. And finally, in 2004, um, they, un they unveiled the, uh, the monument I showed you, the, you know, the one that was meant to balance it all and stuff like that. So that, and the last thing that happened in 2007, they, they, they put the police monument, a new police monument, and I haven't seen it, I didn't find it, but it, they did install a police monument, not at the bottom side, but fairly close. So the point about all this is, is that. You obviously see it's been contested at all different levels, this, right? So we've got, you know, we've got various, you know, groups and you know, fighting the campaign over a hundred years. And the point about this is, is that this is still ongoing, right? I mean, there's still a battle going on. Who is going to have that site? Now, the police have obviously done a deal and got their statue or their, what they want somewhere fairly close. The Illinois Labour History Site, a lot of other campaigners for, you know, more than 20, 20 or 30 years even, have been fighting and got a monument which is some sort of like postmodernist attempt to try and portray it. But what was interesting when we were actually in Chicago and talking about it was first of all the fact that more people probably know about the Haymarket in Bristol than you would find on the streets of Chicago. Right. It's interesting, it's, it's more of a European history. We know about this stuff. In America, you go to Chicago, it was very clear to all of activists that said, well, people just don't know about it. And that's not surprising if you think about it because actually, you know, although there's been struggles since the 60s to get this, this statue there, the main memorial is hidden away in the cemetery, which pe most people don't go to. And you know, this, this has the, been the dominating impression, and then that's disappeared as well eventually. So there is a, re a real lack of knowledge about the Haymarket in Chicago, and a lot of people complained about that. The last thing I want to do is just show a picture of um, which we saw earlier on. So there's the memorial they got, the 2004 memorial that's there. I don't know what you make of it, I guess there's a carriage and some people speaking. And, I don't know what's going on down there, but whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's what that's what's there at the moment, and you know, there's been various um, demonstrations around that May Day and stuff like that. But the events in Chicago on May Day are very small. Okay, then you know, probably smaller than in this city. So there, there's a lack of knowledge about it. Next one. Right, this is some pictures of. I just want to bring you on to a little spat that, that um, which is related to this stuff, because what I'm trying to say is we might be fighting over the history. You know, with 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 the civic authorities about what history is remembered, and it's very important to carry those battles on because you know, you know, what was it somebody once said, who controls the past, controls the present, who controls the present, controls the future. So it is important to carry on these battles to remember the history and not retain it just in the in our little ghettos. It's got to be out there. People have got to know about this stuff. People should know about the 1877 strike in America, or whatever. It's important to know this history, but also there's battles going on right through this time about within the movement itself, within the labour movement, within the left, and within you know, the section of the anarchists as well. And this is a good example of it, right? So we go to the Forest Hill Cemetery to go and find the memorial, and there's a rubbing here, which was taken, you can have a look at in a minute, of, of the, the Haymarket um, monument in, in Forest Hill Cemetery. But, so we, we're hunting around, and this cemetery is mental. If you want to go to a cemetery in America and have fun, if you're a lefty, it's brilliant. Because you walk around going, oh, God, you see the monument, and you know, bloody hell, Emma Goldman's little monument. And this is to Emma Goldman. You walk around going, Arthur Lincoln Brigade, who fought in the Spanish Civil War in there, the Communist Party, everybody's there. <laughs> IWW is wobblies left, right, and centre. Right? It's, it's great. I mean, Steve will tell you afterwards, and, you know, if we had a wicked time. Right, so I'm hunting about thinking, I reckon Lucy's here somewhere. Lucy Parsons must be here somewhere, right? Because everybody else is there, husband's there, and all this sort of stuff. And Emma Goldman's got this big deal and all that. And eventually I found Lucy Parsons' grave, which is this little stone here. It's that big, because there's a rubber in it. It's that big, it's about the size of an A3 bit of paper. 
And I got really upset because I thought, as far as I'm concerned, she's one of the most important radical activists in American history, right? And that's what she gets, right? A little tiny stone. And everybody else, it was the smallest grave, in the, you know, the least important stone in the whole of this massive cemetery full of the Communist Party, the anarchists, everybody's there, right? Um, this, this is a monkey here. <laughs> he, he thinks it's funny. But I'm sad. This. But, but the point about this is, is I thought, I don't know, look at this. What's going on here then? Why is Lucy not known? Is Lucy no more in the Europe? And I spoke to the activist in Chicago and said, yeah, Lucy's no more about in Europe. And actually a lot to do with the activities of class war in the 1980s. Then <laughs> Lucy Parsons is known a lot more about in Europe than known about in the US. And I was like going, why is that? Why does Emma get this fucking great monument and she gets a little tiny stone? Because I'd have it the other way around, personally. But what I found was, I, first of all, was I looked into the history of Emma Goldman and Lucy Parsons. I didn't see much of your future talk. But one of the, what I noticed was there was a huge row between the anarchists around Emma Goldman and Emma Goldman and Lucy Parsons. Right? And the row was very simple. It went like this. Lucy, they, were, they were arguing politically. And Lucy Parsons said, yeah, basically the problem you've got, Emma, is, is you're, t yeah, you're talking about all this useful stuff. It is useful, but you're talking to the wrong people. Right? That's what she said. You're talking to this stuff you're talking about, contraception, but you know, all the birth control, control of reproductive rights, all this sort of stuff. You're talking to the wrong people. You're talking to the middle classes. What is the point of talking to those people? You know, it's pointless. And it's all very nice. And you know, they, and everybody's, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's okay for you to do that. But you're not talking to the right people. You're not talking to the working class. Like, and that's what I'm doing. And that's what we're all doing. That's why we don't do that. And unfortunately, Emma Goldman said, <laughs> back to her, said, well, the problem with you is, Lucy, you've got no politics. You've just been hanging off the coattails of your dead husband for the last 30 years, 20 years. So, which, for a fucking feminist to say to another feminist, that's worse than saying cunt. It's a fucking old <laughs> thing to say. It's a terrible thing to say. So they, they weren't getting on all right. Now, it seems to me that the other problem, Lucy, that's one problem, right? So the anarchist movement is divided, if not sitting on Goldman's side. And, you know, <clears throat> and the other problem is, is that Lucy Parsons famously never trapped herself in one particular ideology. She, you know, what she did, I mean, although she obviously you know, became, went from you know, abolitionism and you know, fighting for the freedom of slaves all the way through to being a socialist and an anarchist, but she also, you know, she never limited herself to purely the ideological position, the ideological organisation. She wanted to organise in the working class and that's what she did. I mean, and consequently, she wasn't too picky about you know, hanging around one particular group. She organised in the working class. Consequently, towards the end of her life, she was knocking around with a lot of communists in the 20s and 30s. And she never joined the Communist no, Party. didn't join the Communist Party. But the point is, <laughs> she's hanging... So now, the, now what's interesting is Lucy... Now I looked in this graveyard, right, and I looked around for all, all the CP members have got proper fucking deal you know, graves, right? Working class, labour organisers, Communist Party have got fucking graves. And they look like they've been paid for by the same, by the party. And they've also looked like they've... So, you know, they're being looked after. She wasn't a member of the Communist Party. She didn't get that. Similarly, because she pissed all the anarchists off because they were all going, oh, she's a communist now, which wasn't necessarily true. She also didn't get fuck all. So she ended up with fuck all. That's... Now, that to me is an interesting history because... How many other people like Lucy Parsons are there in the world who don't, you know, fall into being defended by one ideological group or another? And what happens to them? They fall between the cracks. And often they're the people who are actually organising the working class. And they don't get remembered. And Lucy, you know, made me sad. Didn't it, Steve? <laughs> and that's the end of the talk, really. So. <laughs> In there a film about um, when they unveiled the, the new statue, mm -hmm. um, so I saw that and they... Oh, they one had, more picture. They had someone from like, the police federation. Um, that's, the, that's when they unveiled it, I think that happened. We never forgive, we never forget. It was graffiti night and there's a, actually on top of the statue there was a strike poster, IWW strike poster. But I yeah, there is a film, I haven't seen it, but what there is, is this pamphlet, which I think is somewhat connected to the film, which is about the history of remembering the Haymarket in Chicago, which is where a lot of this stuff, well, certainly the timelines and stuff like that, so it's worth having a look at.
Anyway, what was your question? Uh, that, that was it. It was just like, yeah, because there was, there was another route at the, uh, the yeah. other thing. Raucous, they called it. Was it? Yeah. 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 But it just, what, yeah be- what between what the left and what it the It was the, the, the unions and, and a couple of these anarchists who weren't. The most uh, so they're a little bit socially awkward, but it was about the it was the it was the state, the city of Chicago yeah. as yeah. a state trying to, to say, Oh we're we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna commemorate May Day mm. and and the Haymarket and they were like, Oh no, fuck off because actually we were fucking you lot. <laughs> but they didn't let an anarchist speak, but then when you saw the anarchist, you speak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that was the reason, wasn't it? They were, they were trying to say, oh, this day part of our, is our history. And they would say, well, actually, no, it's not. It's not your history. You know, it's like, this is, this is, this is their order. You know, you shouldn't be, do, you know, it's like part of a tourist board or something. <laughs> you know, come to Chicago and see the, the, the May Day thing. That was the, the big reason they didn't like it. They spat on it, didn't they? Some spat on, they spat on the plaque or something. I don't yeah, str- struggle continues. <laughs> yeah. um, just curious, when is the talk on Emma Parsons? Oh, that's right, Lucy Parsons. <laughs> when is the talk? <laughs> It'll be soon. <laughs> Very soon. <laughs> It'll be soon, yeah. Okay, cool. We'll have to get on to that. So. Okay. Is there any sort of movement at all to do anything with that? Well, it's funny because I did a talk and I, yeah, I did it. One of the talks I did was on, um, like when we're doing talks about radical history out of the States, I generally try and choose something local, do some talk about maybe stuff we've done, but also talk about something local, a couple of things that, which we did everywhere we went. We picked on something, you know, like we went to look at, you know, the Battle of Fallen Timbers, if you know about it, in, in Detroit, which is where the indigenous tribes grappled together and, and were eventually defeated by the settlers and the US Army. But what I didn't know is three years before that they actually slaughtered the US Army there. So Fallen Timbers has three monuments, you know, one to the glorious white settlers for killing those, you know, the Red Indians, one to like uh, there was a battle here and the third one was recognising all the indigenous groups, you know, you could leave tobacco as an offering and all that. So these sites are contested and so I always used to bring bring up in the meeting and say, Well look at that, you know, there's something to be written there, isn't it? because that's exposing different ideological positions about history and how it's changing and stuff like that, and the dates are important, you know. But what I did do was I thought, well, I'll bring up Lucy Parsons then. So in the meeting, I did a meeting, and we, I said, right, my example of something that needs to be done, because it was two, I thought we just held up, you know, who, who's, who's that we held up the road? Who's that? Who's that? You know, does anyone know who Lucy Parsons is? And it was amazing. It's a room full of activists, and only about a third of them, which was shocking, actually, because I was your city, you know, she was central to it. So what I said was, well, there you go, you know, that's a job to start with, you know, we've got to, you know, pick, pick these figures up and start, you know, talking about them, like, you know, and, and you need to talk about them in your city, because, I mean, to me, she, you know, like, like Samuel said, you know, Native American, African American, you know, she covered all the bases, really, if you want to get into some kind of ethnic American argument. She covered all the bases, amazing figure, you know, transition from slavery through to industrial capitalism. She's right there in the centre of all this, and she's, you know, all that, so why don't we even know about her? So I was trying to stir them up, and I think, well, there has been some stuff that's happened, but it'd be great to whack some bigger, you know, something a bit more, some kind of memorial to her somewhere would be great in Chicago. And I know there's, you know, there's some good people there doing stuff, but again, I think she falls between the anarchists and the communists, which is problematic. You know, I really think it is. I think that, you know, you get different activists want to well, emphasize different people, right? Yeah. I know you might disagree with I that, but, but I, 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 think, <laughs> I think that is a problem for, you know, so... But then that's, you know, I'm interested in that. It's a history, isn't it? You've got to get it out, so... Yeah.